Our gospel reading, the sermon this morning, is from Hebrews 11, the first 16 verses. Now faith, well, before I read it, I'm going to mention that there's a translational problem and many new translations with verse 1, and I'm going to read it as it properly should be and is reflected in the King James. But in other translations, it's been put in the subjunctive instead of the, uh, or the, uh, instead of the objective. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the men of old gained approval. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive, even beyond the proper time of life, since she considered him faithful, who had promised. Therefore also there was born of one man, and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number, and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. All these died in faith, without receiving the promise, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city before them. I believe if we were to do a thorough, indeed exhaustive, study of saving faith. It could take weeks, if not a half a year, to preach through that subject in all its rich fullness. Saving faith that God gives to those whom he calls out of darkness into life. But the book of Hebrews has some particular foci, some particular perspectives, that I think are encouraging to consider. And this idea of faith that pleases God is narrow enough for a feeble preacher to get his hands on, please God, and hopefully convey something to you by way of encouragement in thinking this through. The first thing I would ask you by way of stimulating your minds, hopefully, to wrestle with this subject is to ask the question, 
does pleasing God matter? And to make it very personal, do you think you're pleasing God in your daily walk? And as we walk through this, I encourage you to reflect upon that. Each of us do well from time to time to consider, is our walk pleasing to God? And if you think about it, as we prepare to partake of the elements of the ordinance that Christ established the night of his betrayal, one of the expectations historically rediscovered in the Reformation was the need to examine ourselves. And I believe that looking at the nature of saving faith, its characteristics which please God and Christ's example in Noah that he gave us can be helpful in that self-examination. And so I invite you to ponder the texts relevant to that specific subject. Would you turn, if you care to, in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted to the gospel, so we speak. Look at the end of verse 4. Not as pleasing men, but God who examines our heart. And I think we can say the record of Scripture is clear that Paul clearly had a perspective of pleasing God in all of his gospel witness. And then think in 1 Corinthians 7. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, points out that we have a natural inclination to be men pleasers and for instance of our spouse if we're married and so on and that's understandable but the fact is that pleasing God is an objective goal that scripture clearly gives to us his people 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 Verse 1. I won't find it in Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, in Colossians, I mean. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus, that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk and please God just as you actually do walk, that you may excel still more. And this is a momentary digression, but just to note that in a number of places, the scripture links up the idea of pleasing God with our walk with God. And we saw that in the reference to Enoch prior to the reference to Noah in Hebrews 11. And then if you think about it, in God's dealing with Christ is not only our redeemer but our example that this idea of pleasing God was given by God to Christ as a singular point of reflection on his son. At his baptism, chapter 3 of Matthew, it's recorded. Verse 17 the scripture tells us that the voice of God said as the heavenly dove came down representing the power of the Spirit upon the Savior, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So if you haven't thought about it from some other perspective, if you believe that we're called to be disciples of Christ, to imitate Christ, to follow Christ, 
that should be a connection that's not difficult, that the idea of pleasing God should be a central motivation in the life of his people. And then in Matthew 17, on the account of the transfiguration, we see in Peter, James, and John, particularly in Peter, a tendency to sincerely miss the point in wanting to build three tabernacles, one for Christ, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. The cloud overshadows them, and a voice comes out of the cloud, this is my beloved son, listen to him, my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. So the pleasure of God in Christ is a communicable hope for us as Christ's disciples and those redeemed by Christ who are becoming more and more Christ-like. Please God, that's an issue of sanctification that is not inconsequential, it's important. Romans 8. An aspect of faith that pleases God. Verse 6 and following. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now the implication, obviously, is that those who are not in the flesh can, should, and ought to please God. And indeed, are properly to believe that's an ex expectation on the part of God that should be dear to our hearts. And then, if you will, turn back to 1 Corinthians 10. In that great chapter reflecting on Christ as the rock that led the Israelites out of Egypt. Verse 5 tells us in God's estimation of that generation of Israelites, with most of them God was not well pleased. You see that language again? God had little or no pleasure in them. Moses and Joshua accepted. And Caleb. God laid them low in the wilderness because he was not well pleased with them. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, again a helpful reflection on this subject. Verse 14, Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has life with darkness, or what common, what harmony does Christ have with Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them, and notice the phrase, walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate. And do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. I will be a father to you. You shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, the word pleasing is not actually used in that text, but it's helpful to remember that walking with God is impossible without being pleasing to God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 4, and I'm going to read from verse 1. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain. But after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much opposition. For our exhortation does not come from error or impurity, 
or by way of deceit, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, we speak not as pleasing men, but God who examines our faith. I wanted to come back to that again because Paul really is summarizing the direction and the focus of his whole ministry, which was pleasing God. And then, uh, I'm not going to turn there to read it, but godly speech is an element of our pleasing God, reflected in that Thessalonian passage. And Paul speaks in Romans 15 of having a desire to please God. And let's turn there for just a moment. That's significant. Romans 15, verses 1 through 3. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weakness of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Here again, this idea of pleasing somebody is the resident, but the scripture is saying, where are you focusing it? That each of us please his neighbor for good to his edification. And that's a reflection of the second great commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves. But verse 3, even Christ did not please himself. Even Christ did not please himself. So that's a call to turn from the idolatry of self to a conspicuous and conscious focus on pleasing God. And, of course, we please God when we obey him. And we please God, back to Hebrews 11 and verse 6, when we believe that he is. Remember when Moses asked Christ in the burning bush, Who shall I say you are? Christ answered, You shall tell the people, I am who I am. The verb to be. And The author of Hebrews reflects that, saying we are to believe that he is. That's talking about his existence, his nature. We're in faith to come and accept and embrace everything the scripture says about the person and work of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now I believe that one of the helps that we need as feeble children is not only principles and propositional statements, not only precepts, but examples. And in our text in Hebrews, I think it's tremendously significant that the author makes a particular emphasis or holds a particular emphasis on Noah, verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned by God about things not yet seen, in reverence prepared an ark for the salvation of his household, by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Now, there's many other heroes of the faith mentioned in Hebrews 11, but there are some unique things about Noah, not only that in his obedience... Rising out of faith, he condemned the world. But he made it very clear that he was willing to believe God on the basis of what God said. If you look at your bulletin, there's some excellent quotes on the side facing the order of worship. And John Trapp has a quote that I thought was delightful. It is the nature of faith to believe his bare word. In other words, without any visible support. And just above it is a quote from Thomas Adams. It is the office of faith to believe what we do not see. And it shall be the reward of faith to see what we do believe. That beautifully describes Noah's situation. 
He was warned by God. And think for a moment. If we go back to Genesis and look carefully at what Genesis says about the world, a mist came up from the ground and watered the earth. And before the flood, the firmament was surrounded the earth. And I personally believe that's one reason there are fossils in the very northern islands of Canada, the northernmost islands, as well as fossils in Antarctica of tropical plants. Because I believe that with that firmament surrounding the earth, it modified the climate. It kept the harmful effects of the sun that we experience today at bay. And no rain was necessary. So if you believe that, it doesn't take much of a leap to an application to realize that if indeed the earth was watered for the first 1,700 or so years by a mist arising from the ground, that when Noah, a preacher of righteousness, said it's going to rain, there's going to be a flood, can you imagine the response? Come on, Noah. You're out of your mind. And we're told that he was a preacher of righteousness. He persisted in faithfulness. Peter tells us that in 2 Peter 2. He obeyed explicitly. And in Genesis 6.22, it says, Noah did all that God required of him. He did everything. So he persisted in faithfulness in the face of opposition. And best we can figure out, it's approximately about 150 years it took to build the ark. And as he's building, he's also preaching. He's preaching the gospel. And how many converts? Consider it 150 years of preaching. Seven converts. His wife his three sons and their wives. None of his sons, wives, families believed. Very possibly Noah's wife had family members still alive, but none of them believed. And yet he was faithful. So this is, I think, giving some powerful indications of faith that pleases God. And then it tells us in Genesis 7, in the first four verses, that when, when the ark was finished and the food was put in the ark and the animals brought in, God has Moses and his immediate family go into the ark and he shuts the door. And then what happens? Nothing. Nothing for seven days before the rain starts. And can you get just perhaps some sense of the temptation that could have been brought by Satan to tempt Noah, Noah to doubt God's promise? But he never rejected God's word. So thinking about this for just a little bit in our personal life, A good question, again, to raise, do I seek to please God? I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have heard the term seeker-friendly church. I've always been intrigued, I say always, that wasn't accurate, I have long been intrigued by the fact that in John 4, in Christ's discourse with the Samaritan woman, it tells us that God seeks those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Now we are to seek to worship God, amen, but not seek to find a church that satisfies us first of all, but a church that seeks God first. That's a complete change from an egocentric view of church attendance. That the first reason that we come together as congregations is to worship. 
And think about the issue of worship for just a moment. We're in an incredibly individualistic society. And the rise of electronic chat rooms and all sorts of things has enabled millions of people now to express their opinion broadly, to be heard, to be contested with, to be appreciated or to be viled, reviled. But the internet has become a great opportunity for an increase in an egocentric lifestyle. And please don't walk away thinking I'm now condemning the internet across the board. I'm just saying that there's some good in it and some bad, but it has become a vehicle for the antithesis of a mindset of worship. Consider worship that's biblical. You come together. There's a call to worship. There's a call to set aside your daily mental activities as well as your concerns and so on, and your projects. And then in the actual worship service, what do we do? We subordinate our individual preferences. If there's a hymn that we don't particularly enjoy, unless we're very rebellious and angry, we still sing the sin, the hymn. Because that's a congregational activity. We join in unison in not only singing, but in other worship activities, such as listening to the pastoral prayer, some praying in unison, but the whole focus is on God and not on us. It's setting aside our individualism to subordinate self to the Savior. That's why worship is the pinnacle of congregational life, if it's rightly understood. Because in heaven, the total emphasis for every one of those who have pleased God in this life will be an absolute, unending, perfect, uncontaminated focus on God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in worship. It will be a complete dying to self. There will be no more temptation to be an individual. You know what the Greek term for individualism was? Idios. The term from which we get our word idiot. So worship, by its very nature, pleasing God in worship, is helpful in our feeble estate to develop a mindset in which we more and more focus on Christ and more and more diminish our focus horizontally out there to the world. Now, that doesn't mean that we give up on evangelism or something like that. I'm not suggesting that for a moment. But a faith that pleases God is consummately Christ-centered. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. What do we hope for? Not just to be in heaven, but to be in heaven in Christ. Not just to be in heaven, but to be immersed in an interactive, adoring relationship with Almighty God, moment by moment. That's what we hope for. To see Jesus face to face. To bask in the glory of his presence. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. And the whole, is, the whole issue of evidence, of course, is powerful. But one I will just mention, which is implicit in what our, we've been considering, is a change of expectation and desire. Summed up well in the activity and action of faith called pleasing God on God's terms. A few final thoughts. When the rain started back there in Noah's day, do you think it's presumption to suggest the people were startled? And they had undoubtedly a brief period in which to reconsider their rejection of Noah's preaching. To reconsider it. 
and to realize before condemnation forever and ever that they'd made the ultimate blunder that's possible in the human race. And I ask you this morning, if in desiring to please God, which I hope and pray each of us do each day to walk with Christ, have you entered the ark? Christ is that ark. Christ is ex as exclusively the ark today as the actual wooden ark was in Noah's day. Does your faith conform to that of Hebrews 11, 1. Are you hoping for a relationship with Christ in eternity that is Christ-centered, Christ-honoring, Christ-consumed, Christ-adoring, Christ-pleasing, thereby and through Christ and in Christ to glorify the Father? Well, if we go back to our text for a moment, we see that God in looking and revealing to us men who had a passion to please God and with whom God was pleased, that God promised a great ultimate benefit. By faith we understand by faith, the declaration of Scripture. And I'd love to have the time to go into a brief excursion on presuppositional apologetics, which is not evidential defense of the faith, but presuppositional defense of the faith that, of course, includes evidences, but is not based first on evidences, but on the proclamation of the Word of God as simple divine statement that's forever sufficient in and of itself must believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. Of course, there's all sorts of temporal rewards. Proverbs 16, 7 tells us that when a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. That's beautiful. There's an interesting one in Ecclesiastes 7, if you care to turn there. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. Take me a moment there, dear ones, to get to 7. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 26. And I discovered more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are chains. Referring, of course, to an adulterous woman. Notice the second half of verse 6. One who is pleasing to God will, not might, will escape from her. But the sinner will be captured by her. There's a good verse for the millions of young men who profess to be Christian and are trapped in the bondage of pornography. That in pleasing God, he protects us from temptation that may otherwise overwhelm us. But most of all, the reward is to be with God forever and ever and ever. Does your walk please God? May God grant each of us the grace to say in truth, yes and amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that you give to your redeemed people through the gift of saving faith, the gift of God-pleasing faith, as we grow in grace. May that be a burning desire of our hearts to please you in faith in all that we do and say and think in public and in private at rest or at work. 
or wherever we are. With our eyes so firmly fixed on heaven that when you call us in that moment to depart this life, if you do not come first, Lord Jesus, we will consider that cause, call to leave this present earth and our mortal body as a wonderful part of pleasing you. We pray this, Father, in the name of your Son, who pleased you, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.